Travel is often centered around ourselves. We choose a destination that we like, a place to stay that has the comforts we want and need, and we plan days full of activities that we love to do. But the thing is, the decisions we make as travelers impact more than just us. Our travels impact the communities we visit in different ways, from economic to even political. And nowadays, health is a major factor too. Today, we're going to explore what it means to decenter ourselves as travelers. Here to talk about it is Joanna Haugen. She is a solutions oriented writer and public speaker who works at the intersection of sustainable travel, environmental conservation, and community based advocacy efforts. But before we dive in, I want to check in with Katie because this is the first episode of season four, which is kind of wild. And we're just coming off like a huge break. We were on break for four months from the podcast. Yes, Erin, so good to see you. We weren't really on break, though. Like we're saying we were on break, but we've been doing stuff this whole time. So we've very much been in touch this entire time. Yeah, <laughs> we, didn't, we took a break, but not a break from each other. Exactly. Yeah. Anyways, but how was how your summer? I mean, I know about your summer, but our alpaca pals don't. Well, I had a great summer, and I'm surprised at what a great summer I had, considering I had zero hope for how it would turn out. <laughs> um, got to spend some really nice time with you. I moved in May, so now I have a brand new home. I don't even know where to begin. Like, we had the best camping trip ever. We talked a whole lot about it in our bonus episode, which I am still, I'm still not over this camping trip, but... Yeah, we went rafting down the Grand River in my new hometown of Brantford, which was such a good time. Um, yeah, how was your summer, Andrew? Tell me about it. Similarly, my summer was much better than I expected because I definitely was like, the summer is doomed, just like all of 2020 <laughs> was. But yeah. surprisingly, it wasn't. I actually had a great summer, did lots of exploring around Ontario Going out to Brantford was honestly a highlight. I loved seeing your new home and hanging out with your pup, Joe. And that <laughs> rafting trip was so fun. Like Alpaca Pals, Katie's hometown is lit. She took me and we got on this weird floaty thing and we floated for an entire day through like storms, through sunshine. <laughs> yes. We were like getting in the water. I was going on tangents about Titanic. It was great. It was so much fun. The best part too is that you posted a video about it on TikTok and somebody was like, do not swim in that water, whatever you do. And we're like, well, we very much did. Too and late. We're fine. Too late. They're like, you will glow in the dark after. And I'm here to tell you that the Grand River has been cleaned out since those rumors were around. So exactly. Just shut it. <laughs> yeah. So overall, great summer. I mean, it's September now and I'm pretty bummed that that means summer is over, but we'll find ways to enjoy fall in Ontario. Oh, and fall is a great season. Like, I think we're pretty much set up for success. Uh, we've been through what, how, however long, how like millions of years now of figuring out how to have fun without doing much. So I think we got it in the bag. I'm I'm not worried. I guess my problem is I just was not meant for this climate. I really <laughs> believe that. I just don't belong in cold climates. I don't thrive in cold climates. I'm really a summer person. You know, when we had that heat wave in August and everyone was freaking out because it was like 40 degrees in the city. Yeah. I was thriving. I was out every <laughs> night till like 12 p.m. hanging out on patios. I just love it. I love when it's boiling hot outside. Oh, it makes That's me so happy. My worst nightmare. I would much rather be cold than hot. Like I thrive in winter, but also I'm very like I'm a winter sports kind of person. Like I grew up skiing and skating and I would much prefer to be in multiple sweaters than not being able to take off any more pieces of clothing because I'm already naked and still sweating. Like, that's a hell no for me. I don't know oh. why you like that. Like, I don't like the feeling of walking around a city when it's super, super hot outside and it's dark and you're like, ooh, it's one of those nights where I'm like out going to the bar and walking around. It's so hot. I'm in my cute little outfit. No. For me, that looks like legs rubbing together the whole night, practically bleeding. I'm sweating. My makeup is halfway down my face and I'm just having an asthma attack. Like it's a no for me. Like I can't with the hot, hot summer weather. It's just no. 
I think Luke recently told me, actually, he was like, the one thing I always know about you is that you're cold. Because <laughs> it's a daily argument in our house about the temperature. I'm just always cold. And I think that's why I thrive in the heat wave, because it's the only like time of year that I don't feel an ounce of coldness. Like even in the summer, I carry a sweater with me, even when it's like 30 degrees outside, because I just think to myself, I don't know when I might feel cold, it could happen. So... <laughs> <laughs> so yeah summary is that i belong in the southern hemisphere summary is once this pandemic is over and travel makes sense again you will be in hot weather every winter 100 percent. um before we dive into this conversation too uh aaron you have kind of a sad announcement to make i think and it regards our long-standing podcast mascot who has gone back home overseas. Do you want to tell us about it? <sighs> Alpaca Pals, you might remember at the very inception of this podcast back in whatever year that was, if you go back to season one, you will hear the original Alpaca My Bags mascot. I wouldn't call her a mascot though, because she's a living, breathing thing. Annie, the cat. Anyways, when we used to record the podcast in my living room, Mm-hmm. Annie would always, I called it her like cat witching hour, because in the evening she would go through these fits where she would just meow and like run all over the living room and it was really loud. And <laughs> Katie was like, well, we can't really remove that from the podcast. So Annie just became part of the podcast. So if you listen to season one and a bit of season two, you will hear that because she's in so many episodes. I figured it added character. Of course. Here's the thing, though. Annie isn't actually my cat. She belongs to my best friend, Phil. And the reason I had her was because Phil moved to the UK. He did the classic, I'm going to move to the UK and then come back in a year. And he did not come back in a year. Spoiler alert. He never came back. <laughs> he never came back. He's still there. But um, yeah, so Phil came to visit at the end of August and... As part of that visit, we decided he was going to take Annie to the UK with him. So Annie has moved. She has left us. She has gone by plane all the way to London, and she is now a British cat. She's an international kitty. So I'm pretty sad. It's just, it's weird being in a one cat household again. I showed Lucas a video of a cat on TikTok today, and he said, we have to get another cat. So... <gasps> Don't be it's surprised, happening. Alpaca Pals, because Luke and I are very cat obsessed and we love Crumpet, but there's just something really special about seeing two cats together. So, And plus, not to mention the fact that Crumpet has been crying ever since Annie left. She's so. been really sad. She's super snuggly and I think she'll be okay. I think she's going to be okay. It's just so cute to see her with another cat. <laughs> I'm actually, surprisingly, I'm less on the yes let's get another cat stream like it's this is really luke driving this he's like we have to get another cat so i'll pack a palace like when my birthday rolls around or christmas if you see a kitten on our instagram that's because lucas made an executive decision and got a kitten and gave it to me under the guise <laughs> of a present <laughs> so stay tuned stay all right tuned. should we get into this episode yeah let's do it Welcome, Joanna. Thanks for having me on today. We have emailed a little bit back and forth. Actually, we emailed right when vaccinations were ramping up here in Canada. And you had mentioned to me that you were feeling skeptical about the narratives we were seeing in the media about vaccination at that time. Could you describe um, what exactly was making you feel skeptical about the way that vaccines were being discussed? I guess this was in spring of 2021. Yeah. Um, so I actually went back and checked and we were in contact in March. And at that time, I was living in a country that was considered to that is considered to be a mid income economy. COVID numbers were very high, vaccinations were not available, and um, they continue to not be readily available. And at the time, within the travel context, we were starting to hear this narrative that travel is restarting. 
and that, you know, vaccinated travelers should pack their bags and get ready to go because the world is reopening. But looking out my window, the pandemic was definitely still raging, and it is still very much an ongoing public health crisis in the majority of the world. And what was so concerning to me is that this message of restarting tourism was coming from within the tourism industry. And of course, this makes sense, right? The tourism industry has absolutely been decimated over the last 18 months. But this message of opening borders and getting started and, you know, returning to business as usual was butting up against two other very distinct messages. One of these messages was this commitment to diversity, inclusion, and equity. Of course, vaccine inequity is a very real problem. And we had destinations and companies who were saying, we're open, we want you here, and also we are 100% committed to DEI. And there was this disconnect between that DEI commitment and this desire to immediately open borders and resume travel as normal. And the other message that really seemed to be in conflict with this restarting travel message has been this desire stated by the tourism industry to, quote unquote, build back better. And presumably, uh, this means that tourism wants to create a model that is healthier, safer, more sustainable, an ecosystem that is not extractive and exploitative as the one that we've been living in, right? This new model, building back better in this way, would be one that benefits people in the destinations where we travel and it minimizes harm. And yet again, we were hearing this message, of, we're restarting, we're opening our borders. But that was doing harm, that is doing harm. And so um, encouraging vaccinated travelers who are presumably people of privilege who have had access to vaccinations to start traveling again to destinations where people might not have access at all created this narrative that people from more, quote unquote, developed nations were needed to save the tourism industry. And this really is a reinforcement of that white savior narrative. Yeah, I agree with all of that. I I have found that I take like particular issue with people. People are talking about being in the post-pandemic phase. And it's like, okay, maybe in your town or city, it feels like you're in a post-pandemic phase. But even now, like Delta is ramping back up, even in North America. And we really aren't. We really aren't there. And I feel like that has been sort of the the phrase in marketing that you see is being used to like encourage people to get back to travel because, oh, you know, the pandemic's over. We're in the post-pandemic phase. So now you can travel again where, like you say, in reality, most of the globe is like not nearly at the stage that we are at here in North America. I mean, we are still very much in the midst of a pandemic. It's real. It's still happening everywhere. And in a lot of parts of the world, vaccinations aren't expected to even be readily available until into 2022. So yeah, we had emailed about this topic. And I had thought that it was a really great starting point for this discussion about how to decenter ourselves as travelers. Because this is now something that we need to consider if we want to decenter ourselves when we travel, we need to consider what is the health impact that I will have on the community that I'm visiting. This is something we've never had to think about before. And I think for a lot of people, it is like a novel new idea to actually have to consider, okay, is my vacation to Mexico like actually a good idea right now? Not just for me, but for the people on the other end. We need to consider whether or not the communities there are protected by a vaccine or other means. We need to consider what community spread is like in their community, but also in your own community if you're going to be traveling from one location to another. Yeah, there's a whole slew of things that you need to think about if you want to decenter yourself as a traveler in this scenario. And in my mind, decentering yourself as a traveler is just taking the time 
to think through why you are visiting a destination and what impact that visit may have and how you're going to contribute to that community. How would you describe decentering yourself as a traveler? To me, it's really about having an awareness of yourself, your actions, and what it means for you as an individual to be in this specific space at this specific time. We all need to realize that our presence has some sort of impact. Sometimes that's positive. Sometimes that's negative. We have an impact simply in being here right now on the environment, on the culture, on people. By being in a space, we become part of the story in some way. And of course, this all sounds very focused on the self, but that's really important to understand and have that awareness because it's only then that we can be really intentional in our actions and our interactions and encounters with other people. It's about taking that extra moment to ask why we have a gut reaction when we observe something or why we might attribute a certain label or or phrase or thought to something that we experience. Maybe why we feel the need to insert our story or our opinion when somebody is sharing theirs. It's, It's just taking that moment really to be very aware. I I mean, the the truth is that without travelers, there is no tourism, right? Travelers make tourism exist. And yet the travel experience has been catered to the travelers, often to the detriment of local communities and the environment. And decentering ourselves from this story as a traveler-centric space really requires unlearning the dominant travel narrative which in a very crude term, it's that people and places exist for travelers' entertainment, enjoyment, and comfort. In an episode last season, actually, our guest Zach famously said, no, the world is not your oyster. And he said this in reference to the idea of decentering yourself when you're traveling. And I think that that quote just so perfectly sums up what it is about travel that can be sometimes problematic. Like the idea of the world being your oyster is so self-centering and it kind of motions to the privilege and sometimes the entitlement that I think some people feel when they travel, like you're saying, like travel is for me, like this is all about my entertainment. I'm about to go off on like a bit of a tangent, but I actually think the self-centering is connected a bit to our capitalist society because people have like two weeks a year that they aren't owned 40 hours a week by their job. And so when those two weeks roll around, naturally, you want to make those two weeks about you and about your escape and about your relaxation, because you do genuinely need it. And given this, it doesn't surprise me at all that we tend to see this like tendency of feeling, oh, the world is my oyster, like during these two weeks that I have to myself. (laughs) Um, So how would you say that travelers can start practicing decentering themselves when traveling? Yeah, you know, I remember Zach saying that on your podcast (laughs) last season. And I was like, yes, that is a perfect way to frame that idea, right? Because I I think what's so important about decentering ourselves is the intention we do deserve that time off. We do need to step away from the chaotic day-to-day that we live in. But I think what is really important is that we need to go beyond where we go and what we want to do and really spend some time thinking about why and how. For example, instead of just saying, um, you know, where we want to go, I would love to suggest that we think about why we want to go there. Why do we want to participate in a particular activity? You know, do we want to go dog sledding in Norway just to check something off the bucket list? Or do we want to learn something about the Sami culture or of which, you know, dog sledding is a part You know, and one of those activities is centered on the traveler and the other is centered on an indigenous community and culture. And we can still enjoy dog sledding. We can still get something out of that activity in a very fun and enjoyable way, but we can change our perception of why we might be doing that and both have a good time 
and also realize that this is not just about us and our desire to take part in this activity. And then the other part of that is really think about how we're going to have a travel experience, right? So are we going to look up those must-see lists and just tootle around town, or are we going to do some research before we go somewhere so that we have cultural and historical context for the place we're visiting and the culture we're encountering? You know, are we going to book with the cheapest tour operator who's just going to shuttle us from, you know, trinket shop to trinket shop? Or are we going to book with a local operator that might take a little extra time to find, that might cost a little more, but who is actually a local person? And when we book with them, that money is actually staying in the local community. You know, are we as travelers willing to accept the dominant narrative that is known about a place and a travel experience? Or are we willing to get uncomfortable and ask hard questions about colonialism and marginalized communities in a place and environmental issues? It's moving beyond what we want to do to how we're going to have those experiences. I feel like a lot of it is really about education. Like it's for entertainment to a degree, but also acknowledging that like there's a huge educational factor when you travel that can really like enrich the experience. And I think what's so great about that is decentering yourself as a traveler can actually, I think, enrich your own experience as a traveler too. Even though you're trying to decenter yourself, it actually benefits you as well because you will have a more thorough and enriching experience of a place and a culture and you'll walk away with knowledge that you can have with you for your lifetime. I think it makes our experiences more meaningful. So would you say like decentering yourself starts sort of in the process of travel when you're thinking about traveling to a place or thinking about where you're going to travel? Like first you'll think about where do I want to go? How am I going to get there? What am I going to do there? But why and how are sort of the last two questions that you have to ask yourself before actually booking that trip? Yeah, I think, you know, both in the planning stages and booking stages, but then also, again, being really aware when you are actually on the ground and thinking about how your actions and your interactions have, uh, have an impact on the place and the people while you are traveling. So I think those are just questions that you should, you know, keep in mind while you're traveling, just to maintain that sense of awareness and intention. In an article you wrote earlier this year for your site, uh, you brought up a point that Katie and I found really thought provoking about responsible travel. You explained that travelers who are thinking about responsible travel are likely already practicing it or learning to, which is great. Um, The question is, how do we make responsible travel the norm? How do we get casual travelers to think about it? Um, And do you think that travelers who are thinking about decentering themselves and traveling in a more mindful way are in a bit of an echo chamber when it comes to these issues? Unfortunately, I do think that a lot of this is echo chamber, and it's actually um, one of the reasons why I would love to see more collaborations from within the travel industry with spaces and brands and people that are not part of the travel space. I think that's one way that we can start to connect with people who I consider to be casual travelers. And by that, I mean, you know, people who are traveling, who are enjoying their two weeks off, but who aren't thinking about these things, who aren't asking these hard questions and doing this research. And quite frankly, there will always be casual travelers. There will always be people who don't think about these things. I mean, just as you have folks who who don't think about food waste in their homes, who don't think about what it means to buy electronics that can't be fixed, right? Like there are different aspects of sustainability in all of our lives that we maybe don't even realize. You know, people don't know what they don't know. And so for that reason, the ideal condition is that responsible travel practices are created with intention by default from the industry side. And so what I mean by that is that destinations and tour companies and other service providers, accommodations are instituting responsible and sustainable practices so that when anybody 
travels with them or to those destinations, they have no choice but to act in a way that is responsible or that is, you know, more responsible than they maybe would without that direct guidance. So for example, you see this, actually Venice is looking to institute a booking system and an entry fee for tourists. Now this doesn't seem very appealing for the average traveler who might appear and be like, I don't want to pay to go to Venice or I don't want to, you know, why should I have to do that? I've already spent a lot of money to get here. Well, that is in Venice, the destination's best interest to maintain the integrity of the destination. And so they are instituting a a policy and a protocol that puts sustainability at the at the uh, forefront. I mean, I don't know what that money is going toward, but I would assume some of that might be, you know, is maybe being used to restore buildings. And, you know, that booking system ensures that it's a higher quality space for the people who live there. You know, you're starting to see Airbnb restrictions in some cities. That's another great example There are places that have tourism pledges that you can't help but to opt in with. It is in your face when you fly to those destinations. It is part of the experience. When it becomes the norm to behave in an appropriate and responsible way, you know, that's when the casual traveler becomes a more responsible traveler, Mm. whether they intend to or not. So it's sort of like, we can take an industry-led approach where the industry simply creates the environment for people to be traveling more responsibly to the point that it becomes normalized and travelers don't question it at all. I think what's important to think about is that just generally, people are becoming more aware of, say, the climate crisis. So it will become normalized in places if there are protocols in place to minimize an environmental footprint. Maybe you have to minimize your water usage when you go somewhere, when you check into a hotel. That will become just part of the experience because as humanity, we need to address the climate crisis. And part of that is being responsible for our water usage. So I think we're actually going to see this across, you know, across the world and integrated in so many sectors and parts of our daily lives that when we travel, it will just kind of be part of the travel experience. And, you know, that's the ideal condition. You mentioned the tourism tax that was introduced in Venice, which is interesting to me because I actually lived in Venice for several months and living there It's not the same as just visiting, but living there, I could really, really see how the local community was being impacted by the massive influx of tourists that would arrive in the summer. Um, For context, I moved there, I think, in February. And in February, it is a ghost town, barely any tourists. And just four months later, it is a completely different world. There are days where you literally like cannot cross the street because there are so many people packed into these alleyways in this beautiful city that is really crumbling because of this mass amount of tourism. And introducing tourism taxes tends to be really um, controversial, I find. And I remember when we went to Thailand, there was one island that we visited where they had done this. They'd introduced a tax. So to visit the island, you had to pay like a daily fee to be there. It made me think about Venice because it was like, especially in the context of Thailand, it's not very expensive for a Western traveler to be there. And so to be asked to spend, I think it was like four or five dollars a day to enjoy an island and contribute to the upkeep and protection of that ecological space is really like it's it's really a low bar to be asked and yet people really complain about it I'm saying all this to like get to this point that I've been thinking about in decentering yourself about budget travel and we actually did an episode on budget travel last season where we talked about how this like mindset of traveling as cheaply as possible can sometimes be really detrimental to the communities we visit. And I actually think like in the context of decentering yourself, it can be really harmful because you're making it about spending as little money as possible for yourself when really like spending money is such a big part of contributing to the communities that you're visiting. 
And so when people complain about these taxes, I just think that's part of the privilege of travel. Like you have to be willing to contribute to the upkeep of these communities. Yeah. And um, actually, to that point, I was just thinking the other day about this idea of bargaining. You know, if you're trying to talk a local local fruit seller down 50 cents or a dollar on the, you know, one bundle of bananas he's going to sell today, you know, who wins? You know, you walk away with a cheaper bunch of bananas, but that really, that experience was about you getting, getting the win. You're absolutely right. The whole idea of budget travel and, and all the things that go in with that, you know, bargaining and staying at rock bottom hostels where you're cooking in the kitchen and not, paying to go somewhere to eat, or I think we can travel in a way that maybe is less expensive. We can do that in a smart way, um, you know, by saving money on airline flights, right, or on ground transportation. But when it comes to the communities we're in, how can we make sure that our presence has the most positive impact possible? And actually, like, like you say, I don't think like, budget travel always has to be bad. Like, for example, when we traveled in India, we made the choice to stay in lower end hotels, but they were often locally owned. And we chose that over like larger chains. And so in that context, yes, we were saving ourselves money, but we were also doing it in a way that like supported local people more so than staying at the sort of like bigger chains that a lot of Westerners opt to stay at end up doing. Katie, as you know, travel for me doesn't always go according to plan. Oh, I am well aware. I've heard enough stories on this podcast to know that mishaps can happen when anyone travels. Absolutely. And when they do, you need travel insurance. And I couldn't recommend World Nomads more as your go-to. And they've actually helped me out of a super scary situation before. When I ended up in hospital in Australia late at night, World Nomads provided me with emergency assistance so I could get the help I needed and carry on with my trip. World Nomads policies are simple and flexible. They cover over 150 adventure activities, including higher risk activities like scuba diving and trekking. Benefits limit, conditions and exclusions apply. Be sure to read your policy wording. Learn more and get your travel insurance quote at worldnomads.com. The link is in our show notes. So before we move on, I just wanted to ask what you think happens when we and the industry don't decenter ourselves. Could you describe what some of the consequences of this traveler focused mindset, but also the tourism industry means for communities around the world? Uh, Yeah. So a couple of years ago, there was a report published by the Travel Foundation about the invisible burdens of tourism. And I love that terminology, invisible burden, because, you know, we know what some of the consequences look like when travelers are burdens, because we have seen this. It's things like over tourism or travelers who are uh, clearly acting disrespectful in some way. But there are so many more burdens that we can't see, that we maybe don't think about. Again, travelers don't know what they don't know. So something like using up precious water resources or, you know, creating waste. When you throw something away, when you travel, where does it go? Not every community has the infrastructure to manage waste. In the case of COVID, This is a a burden if you're taking up space in a hospital or if you need some sort of emergency care when local people don't have access to that care or local people might get sick if you transmit uh, COVID. So these are all burdens that come along with being a a traveler. And I think a really great example right now, um, perhaps you've seen it in the news, is that Hawaii is really struggling with COVID numbers. And there are some water shortages, I believe, on Maui, where water is being diverted from local folks, but travelers are not being asked to cut back on their water usage. 
And this is one of these examples of, you know, you might need to do some research to realize that right now is not a good time to go to Hawaii. And not only is right now maybe not a good time to go to Hawaii, but decentering ourselves would be looking at this situation. And if you decide to go, being very mindful about how much water you're using, donating to a local indigenous organization that is on the ground doing work to ensure people have enough resources. This is ensuring that you are supporting local communities. Um, and, and the ultimate in decentering yourself in this kind of situation might be saying, this trip is not the right time for me to go and, and canceling your trip right out because the people and the place are paramount here. And right now, you being in that space is not good. It goes back to this awareness of what does it mean if I am in this place and how does that impact negatively or positively on the environment and the people who live here? I love that you've brought up the example of Hawaii because I have seen so much discussion around this. And actually, I wanted to mention there's a traveling family. They're called Local Passport Family. Recently, I don't know her name, but uh, the mom in this family did a whole series on Instagram where she was explaining why the family has canceled their trip to Hawaii. And she cited many of the things you've cited, like the worsening pandemic and water shortages and environmental concerns. And I know overcrowding right now is a big issue because, of course, like everyone wants to go to Hawaii right now. And really, like local governments are asking tourists to wait to visit. And ultimately, she said that their choice was based on this and based on indigenous communities asking people not to come right now and um, just wanting to respect that ask, which I think is a great example of how to decenter yourself when you're traveling. I think that right now it's more important than ever to continually research until you visit a place. Luke and I actually have a trip booked to New York in a couple weeks, and we're very much like, this may or may not happen. It's going to depend on what numbers are looking at and transmission rates and et cetera. And part of prepping for this trip has meant researching like regularly and checking in on the situation there to see whether it's responsible or not to go, as well as keeping an eye on the situation here. And I think that's so important in the context of the pandemic, because you might book a trip to Hawaii for four months from now, and in four months, the situation could have changed, but also could not have. So you do have to like put in the work to check in on it regularly, literally up until like a few weeks or days before you go, because I know local passport family, they had been planning to go like in a couple days and just decided at the very last second that they were going to cancel. To that point, too, I think it's right now it's COVID, right? But we are experiencing more and more major violent climate events. And we need to be willing to look at the plane tickets we've booked and say, I don't think now is the time to go to the Caribbean. Now is not the time to travel, you know, to Germany or wherever um, might be experiencing some sort of major climate concern. Because if you have an emergency as a traveler, you need to be able to deal with yourself. And, and if you need to be evacuated, if you need help, if you need, you know, to get to the grocery store to get food or whatever the case might be. Um, it's not about you. The focus really needs to be on the people who are living in a, in a place. So you mentioned earlier that the travel industry at large is very traveler centric. It is kind of the business model. When it comes down to it, tourism is a product and a service that ultimately serves the traveler. Um, it's literally about providing experiences that center the traveler, although maybe not when you're flying economy on an airplane. <laughs> it's just one thought I had. I don't feel very centered when I'm squished into <laughs> an economy seat. What role would you say the industry itself has in helping tourists decenter themselves? Um, and what steps would you like to see the industry take? It is 100% true. Tourism does not exist without travelers. It is about travelers going places that makes this industry exist. But that doesn't mean that travelers need to be centered in the tourism narrative. Um, some of the things that I would love to see are more transparency 
so that travelers are aware of both their positive and negative impacts. I want to see destinations and tour companies publishing carbon and impact labels. I want to know where money is specifically going. That information is hard to find, but it should be readily available for travelers to access. You know, what does it mean when companies say they're supporting local communities? This is something we're seeing a lot of right now. But what does that mean? Going back to your example in, I believe you said, India, where you stayed at local lower end hotels versus an international chain. Yeah, maybe that international chain is paying local people to, you know, work there. But is the vast majority of money actually leaving the country? How much is actually staying within the community? Where is the money going? So more transparency on the side of the industry so that travelers can learn about what their negative and positive impacts are when they travel and they can make choices based on, for example, their carbon footprint by signing up for this tour versus that tour, or visiting this destination versus that destination. Um, The other thing that destinations in particular can do is promote and amplify more diverse guides and storylines. There is a dominant narrative that has been shared about every destination, and it's the story that we all know, regardless of where you might go. You know, Hawaii is actually a really great example The story in Hawaii is that, you know, it's this tropical paradise and you can hang out on the beach. It's really beautiful. You can go, you know, maybe hiking to overlook this beautiful place and it's lush and tropical. But there are other stories in Hawaii. You know, what is the historical story there that we are not hearing? What are some of the cultural stories that haven't been surfaced? And I don't know much about Hawaii, so I don't know what those storylines are, but they should be made available by the destination just as prominently, if not more so, than the common and dominant narrative about a place. And so, you know, one of the things that I I really do want to see destinations doing is more actively promoting guides who are part of marginalized or oppressed communities. I want them to start being more transparent and open about the different aspects of their community that, you know, we maybe don't talk about, and that might be social challenges or environmental challenges. I mean, there are many, many storylines into a place. Place is a complex thing. It's been shaped over many, many years by many people, many encounters, many cultures. And so there is never just one story. Mm. This is something that like Katie and I have discussed often about the tourism landscape in Canada. We don't have enough indigenous led tourism in this country. And because of that, tourists are missing out on such important stories about this place. And for less tourist centric tourism, we need to have those stories available to us because I have family from Europe that has visited Canada like multiple times, and I've asked them, how much do you know about Indigenous history in Canada? And they can, they barely know anything. And it's like, that's a failure of the industry. And that's a failure of Canada, like actually focusing on Indigenous-led tourism, because that's how we get those stories out there. And I also love your point about more transparency. Like when you want to book a a tour group, you can actually email and demand transparency. And by doing that, we're starting to encourage more transparency in general. When we recorded with Jess from Eternal Landscapes, um, which is a Mongolia-focused tourism operator, she mentioned that she started sharing all this transparent information on the tourism site because someone asked for it. Someone had emailed her and said, I would love to see these numbers. Like, what can you tell me? And she realized, I don't have them. And went and spent a lot of time putting it all together and putting it on the website for more transparency. I think like the onus is ultimately on the industry itself. But as tourists, we do have that little bit of power to ask for it and demand it when we're booking travel. Um, So I think that's like a great tip for things that we ourselves as like individual tourists can do. Also to that point, it's the industry, it's the traveler. And I really think it's important to underscore the importance of travel media as well. If you have any content creators who are listening to this, you know, travel media needs to ask the hard questions and be committed to more transparency as well. You know, 
you are a really important conduit of information. And so if you are a content creator, this is such a, a pivotal moment for you to rethink about the way that you tell stories and how you hold your um, hosts when you go on press trips um, accountable. So yeah, content creators, I think, often are overlooked. And so if you have any travel writers, travel travel bloggers that are on, that are listening to this, you are powerful. Please don't underestimate your influence in this space. Absolutely. I actually saw like such an interesting debate about this recently on Instagram. Like someone had posted that influencers on Instagram in the travel space, like all they're doing is inspiring. Like we can't take them so seriously. And I just thought to myself, actually, like the name for them, influencer, is literally about the role that they play in this industry. Like they influence travel trends to a huge degree. And therefore, like they have a lot of responsibility. Also, as people who aren't influencers or bloggers, make careful choices about who you follow. That's another way that you can really help promote a decentering of yourself as a tourist is by following people who are leading by a good example. I also find like the Hawaii example is really good for this, but there are tons of influencers who are are actually Hawaiian and indigenous Hawaiian that you can follow for information about Hawaii rather than following someone who has lived there for two years and calls themselves a local, but really they're just like from mainland USA. Making those choices is really, really important, I think. In your article, which I mentioned earlier, we're going to link it in the show notes, Alpaca Pals, you say that when those working in tourism recognize their ability to shape travelers' perceptions, they also create the conditions for a much-needed shift in perspective. Could you explain a little bit more what you mean by this? Yes. So, you know, whether we realize it or not, when we travel, we have a picture in our mind about what we're going to see and experience. And there's a reason why we book our trip somewhere. We heard something, we saw something, we have something in mind that is appealing to us and and that's why we're going to travel. This is shaped by so many different influences in our lives. But the way these stories are presented to us then shapes the expectations of how we will have certain encounters and how we should act and behave and what we should think about certain things once we have arrived in a place. So many of the stories that we have received historically have been centered on travelers. You know, this is what you will experience. This is what you will see. This is how you will feel. Um, And those are coming from both the tourism industry and our, you know, friends and families, our influencers and, and the people we follow in social media. So, you know, just as the tourism industry and influencers and whoever else has shaped a traveler-centric story, all of these influences can also tell a story that is more transparent and nuanced and inclusive and that provides more context. If we can create content that is beautiful and alluring and comfortable, we can also create content that is complex and nuanced and inclusive. And by doing that and sharing that as widely as we have shared the dominant narrative, we can begin to shift the way that travelers might perceive their experience once they've arrived in a destination. Yeah. Do you, like, maybe this is wishful thinking, but I do feel that in recent years, there is more discussion that I'm seeing more people move towards this kind of content, this more thoughtful travel content. This is just like anecdotal observation. But do you think that we are starting to see people sort of gravitate in that direction a bit more? I do in that people, I think in general, are beginning to expect from the brands in their lives that they are more responsible and that they are more transparent. And I don't think that that is just in tourism. I think that's across all sectors, all industries. People in general are starting to demand that brands are more transparent. 
Um, now, all that said, I do still think that there is a certain extent of an echo chamber when it comes to travel content and mindful travel content being shared to people who are inclined to lean toward mindful travel content and people who are just following, you know, influencers and um, travelers who still do create content that is set against a beautiful backdrop. Uh, again, we kind of come back to that thing with the casual traveler, right? If the average influencer and the average traveler influencer is still putting that stuff out there because they don't know any better or they don't really care and their followers are just following them for the beautiful backdrop, there is a lost opportunity there. So I do see more nuanced discussion, better transparency across the board, but there is still a lot of content out there that definitely isn't more mindful and responsible. I think brands and destinations and companies will have to step up eventually. That's just an expectation of the consumer. But the average person who is sharing a story or sharing content is not necessarily going to be held to that same standard by the people who follow them. I don't know. Maybe it's maybe it's a change that's coming. I hope so, um, because I am seeing more. But again, I am working in this space. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's tough because I even think that sometimes about like this podcast, I think people probably really seek it out to listen to these kinds of discussions. And sometimes I think, well, I would really love for people who maybe have never once thought about this to listen to this content and start to learn a few things. I mean, I myself have learned so much in making this podcast. And so I would love for it to break through this echo chamber and reach people who maybe haven't like considered some of the topics that we've talked about. <laughs> Actually, like that's part of the reason why we called the podcast what we did. Like Alpaca My Bags is a very just sort of neutral like travel oriented. We didn't want to make it too like responsible travel um, focused in the title because we thought, oh, maybe that'll attract people who otherwise wouldn't find the show and wouldn't be looking for like this particular niche, I guess, of uh, travel content. So I don't know if that strategy is working. Maybe like some of our listeners can ping us and let us know. Yeah, you know, and I, I think this is where collaborations are a huge untapped opportunity in the tourism industry. You know, brands like yours could be partnering with totally unaffiliated brands that have nothing to do with travel, but that may catch the interest of people who are casual travelers. I, I've written quite a bit about this because I see, for example, a great opportunity for the tourism industry to be connected in some way with, say, H&M, which is serving the festival traveler. Um, you know, and how can we partner with an H&M to just kind of integrate that responsible travel message for people who are, you know, going to festivals and and have a footprint in the community where they're going. Um, you know, so that that's one example. Um, and there have been a couple really innovative collaborations in that way, but there is great opportunity to do so much more by breaking out of the tourism silo and partnering and collaborating with non-tourism focused brands. Mm, I love that idea. Katie, can you get the email for H&M? <laughs> Start looking today. <laughs> <laughs> so to wrap up, do you have any suggestions for how people um, who are working in tourism, but also just individual travelers, can do their part in educating others like the casual traveler about their impact as travelers and how to travel more responsibly? So I guess this is touching on, you know, how we can break through the echo chamber just in really casual ways, like to reach the casual traveler. I'm thinking like, for example, just sharing like a resource on your Instagram, which might reach, you know, a bunch of people who are casual travelers and have never thought about this topic before. Yeah. You know, you mentioned something earlier that I think is really important. And that is just really being mindful of the way we do share our travel stories. 
you know, the next time you travel and you're going to post on Instagram, just think about how that's interpreted by the people who have no other context of where you are, what you're experiencing. Um, This is something I've been thinking about a lot right now because I just moved to Tunisia. And just like any experience where you land in a new country, you know, you're kind of overwhelmed with quite frankly, you know, all the uh, amazing things that are going on around you. And I want to share that. But I also want to provide a very uh, nuanced picture of where we live. Yes, it is beautiful flowers and incredible, you know, seed right down the street. Garbage is an issue. A picture of garbage is not this, you know, as aesthetically pleasing as some of the other scenes that I'm seeing on my walks in the evening. But it's important to provide a, you know, wider picture of my experience here. Um, And so I think we can all use that as a great guidance in how we tell our stories, the pictures we use, the words that we choose. What do we emphasize? What is shown and not shown? And how, how might that be interpreted by the people who are consuming our content? With that in mind, I think it's really important to just remember that your actions matter. People take cues from other people in their lives, whether that be friends or family or followers in some capacity. Even passively, people are looking to other people for insight and cues on how to act. And if you are in any way uh, considered a traveler or working in the tourism industry or anything like that, you know, people are asking your advice. They're looking to you to figure out what kind of actions to take, where they should go, what they should expect, how they should interpret um, what they encounter when they arrive somewhere. So just realize that you are influential, even if you don't think of yourself as an influencer. Your actions matter. I, I think, you know, we hear so much messaging about Uh, We need big systemic changes, but I really also think there's a lot of power in realizing that saying no to a plastic straw might influence somebody else to do the same. And we can take that um, lesson with us when we travel. Absolutely. We actually have recorded an episode which will be released shortly with uh, James Muenda, who's a conservationist in Kenya. And we touched on this exact topic. It's very easy to feel like you are small and meaningless in this world, but really like you have influence and your actions do matter and they do have impact. And I think if we all remember that, we can be agents of change, even if it's just a tiny, tiny little change, like a drop in the bucket, it's still meaningful. Um, Where can our alpaca pals find you if they'd like to read or learn more? Yes, so you can find me online at rootedstorytelling.com and also on Instagram at rootedstorytelling. Those would be the two best places to get in touch with me. Alpaca My Bags is written and hosted by me, Erin Hines, and produced by Katie Lohr. Do you want to support this podcast? If so, there are a few ways that you can. You can leave a review on your podcast app or show us your love on Patreon. Pledging $5 a month or more directly supports the making of this show. The link to our Patreon is in the show notes. That's all for now, Alpaca Pals. I'll talk to you again in two weeks, and I hope you all get to alpaca your bags safely and soon.